Arranging them vertically improves heat dissipation and shortens distances. This creates more space and allows for denser packing. So why hasn't this been done before? Hello everyone, it is great to meet you all. I am Error from Andi Engineering. There are significant changes coming in the semiconductor manufacturing processes, especially with the major foundry companies. One such technology that could potentially revolutionize the flow of manufacturing processes is the Backside Power Delivery Network, also known as BSPDN, which you can see here. The overall process of making semiconductors from the wafer, including the front end and back end of line processes, could fundamentally change. This shift in manufacturing order and methods could lead to a technological gap or provide an opportunity to quickly catch up. Therefore, today, we will discuss the BSPDN technology itself and how Intel is approaching it. Intel, TSMC, and the academic community each have their unique approaches. Today, let's delve into the entire manufacturing process, from wafer creation to transistor fabrication, and then forming metal electrodes to establish power lines. This will help us grasp why the BSPDN method is becoming crucial in semiconductor production facilities. Let's delve into why companies are putting everything on the line for this technology. Can you see this diagram right here? This shows a wafer cross-section during its manufacturing. So you can consider this thin layer as the transistor. In the previous session, I talked about gate all around and FinFET technologies, which act as switches to control the flow of electricity. These structures are densely embedded within the wafer. But what good is it to have them so densely packed if we can't apply voltage and make the current flow through them? To connect them, we need some operations to be addition. Others will be matrix computations. To make this possible, it is essential to supply power. The VSS, by applying voltage to both sides, allows us to determine the voltage level here. This voltage dictates which switches and transistors will operate, enabling the semiconductors to function swiftly. Besides merely supplying power, these transistors also need to be interconnected in specific ways. Some must be linked together, while others should remain unconnected. Therefore, the implementation of operations such as addition, subtraction or storage will vary, as the logical structure is altered. In the conventional structure, all these power supply lines, commonly referred to as power rails, along with the signal lines that facilitate communication between them, are positioned on the front side of the semiconductor transistor. Do you understand what I mean? For example, those of you with a background in electronics might be familiar with a PCB breadboard where you insert resistors, connect wires and attach bulbs, all from the top side. You also connect the battery and resistors from the top side. Essentially, this means that the power supply lines, which we commonly call power rails, and signal wires are all connected from one side. The traditional approach involves meticulously stacking and carving each layer, and this entire process has been consistently carried out on the front side of the wafer. Nowadays, with the continuous miniaturization of transistors due to advanced processes, they need to be packed more densely within the same area. When transistors are densely packed like this, they require a highly intricate network of connections. Both signal wires and power rails need to be interconnected, and when they are all clustered together, it becomes extremely complex. It's incredibly complex. Therefore, let's try separating the power lines from the signal lines. Specifically, let's move the power lines from the top side to the bottom to supply power to the components. This idea is known as the Backside Power Delivery Network, BSPDN. But why exactly move the power lines to the backside? Can you picture the power lines? When I was in my junior year of university, we had an analog circuits lab where we built audio amplifiers. During the design process, our professor stressed the need to make the power lines exceptionally thick. We made the solder really thick. And the reason for this is that the thicker it is, the less power is lost when the same amount of current flows through. I'll go into more detail about this shortly. When the power line is this thick, it has to travel a much greater physical distance. So, what does this imply? Even if the voltage is relatively small, as it travels through this metal pathway, it will encounter resistance along the way, which causes a notable drop in voltage. Are you familiar with Ohm's law, which explains this phenomenon in detail? V equals IR. The metal itself has a specific resistance, and when the same current flows through it, the current hits this resistance, causing a drop in voltage from the original VDD to a slightly lower value. This means that some power is consumed. This phenomenon is often called IR drop. It's akin to the scenario where, if the transmission lines from a power plant to your home are excessively long, substantial power loss occurs during the transfer, reducing energy efficiency. Essentially, the greater the physical distance, the more energy is lost. Thus, the idea is to lower the power distribution metals to place them closer to the transistors. So, it possesses the potential to not only reduce performance degradation, but also minimize heat generation. 
Moreover, by separating the signal and voltage, it allows for a much denser design, does it not? Looking forward, this is the direction we need to pursue. The primary focus is to simplify the power supply and signal lines, which are currently quite complex. The main idea behind BS-PDN is to separate these lines. Traditionally, power lines were positioned above the signal layout, leading to IR drops or energy losses as the power travels from one point to another. This setup offers the advantage of positioning it closer. If you're going to move or separate it, consider it this way. The resistance increases naturally with length. The greater the distance, the higher the resistance will be. In my third year of college, they said to widen the area for an audio amplifier. By widening the area through which current passes and soldering more thickly, resistance is reduced. This means that by shortening the distance, instead of having long paths, you can reduce resistance, thereby minimizing IR drop. This is the concept you should understand, and the illustration you see here represents this idea. Can you see the central part? In the middle section, where the transistors are embedded, these thick parts are generally the regions responsible for voltage delivery. So, by forming these thick voltage rails, VSS and VDD, to prevent IR drop, they are designed to be thick and placed on the backside of the wafer. Meanwhile, signal connections will be handled on the front side. This is the concept you should understand. If we could make it this way, we wouldn't pile complex elements in one place. We would arrange them vertically from the start, helping with heat dissipation and shortening distances. This would make the space more spacious, allowing for denser usage with many advantages. But why haven't we done this? Naturally, we then connect the transistor logic with BS-PDN. To illustrate, when you integrate elements such as SRAM, you establish a power delivery network underneath them. Imagine a circular wafer with power being supplied from both the top and the bottom. Can you visualize that? Do you sense the complexity already? With all these benefits, why hasn't it been done? It's hard, right? I'll explain this. When we talk about wafer fabrication, it includes the front end of line, FEOL, and back end of line, BEOL, stages. The front end of line refers to the process of embedding basic components like transistors and capacitors. These logic elements need to be embedded first, and then the back end of line connects these elements together. By stacking metal wiring, the signal network is connected across the chip. It links the signals. When implementing the backside power delivery network, BS-PDN technology, you need to repeat both the front end and back end stages after completing the initial steps. Typically, without BS-PDN, the process on a wafer starts with etching the transistors, followed by connecting the wiring, which includes both the front end and back end of line phases. Next, there's the fair all and back end of line process. After that, the chip is packaged, diced into individual chips, and packaged again. These steps can be broadly divided into three main stages. However, if BSPDN is applied, after going through the front end of line and back end of line stages 1 and 2, an additional backside process for BSPDN must be added. First, in the process called Ferry, do you see this pin here? This is the process of making transistors. It includes making transistors and capacitors. They are not yet connected. This stage is known as the front end of line, and the back end of line stage involves layering metal interconnects to link signals and power between different components. Once this stage is completed, the next step typically involves connecting these signals, establishing links between devices, layer by layer. This entire sequence is referred to as the back end of line process. Imagine the process of creating beads as the front end of line, and the task of stringing those beads together as the back end of line. Previously, both signal and power connections were managed from the top, making the procedure quite intricate. However, nowadays, while signal wires are still handled from above, the metal layer underneath is employed for power distribution. Power will be supplied through this TSV, which means that power will be delivered from below by drilling through the wafer. To achieve this, the wafer needs to be carefully thinned at the edges, which involves a delicate and precise process. By meticulously thinning the backside and drilling through the TSVs, power can be delivered from both the top and bottom, necessitating the completion of both processes. Even though I've simplified it here, the intermediate steps are extraordinarily intricate. Challenges include thinning the wafer, achieving planarization, establishing connections, and drilling the TSVs. Now, let's examine the pros and cons in detail. As I mentioned earlier, the benefits are numerous. Since the physical distance for delivering voltage is shorter, the power consumption, known as IR drop, is reduced. This alone is a huge advantage. Since the resistance itself is reduced, the likelihood of power reduction is high. Moreover, by vertically segregating the power and signal lines, heat dissipation is enhanced, and the spatial density is significantly increased due to the new positioning. This effectively minimizes heat. These are exceptionally powerful benefits. So, what are the drawbacks? The process is inherently very intricate. We need to not only work on the front side of the wafer, but also the back side. This involves grinding down the back side, creating TSVs, and depositing metals. Essentially, these are additional steps that were not part of the original fabrication process. 
As a result, additional processing steps are required, which inevitably increases costs, and new equipment needs to be introduced. Secondly, while heat dissipation is good, managing it might be difficult. What does this mean? Historically, all the components were fabricated solely on the wafer's front side, which guided our density and layout calculations. However, with the new approach of utilizing both the top and bottom, we must reevaluate the thermal dynamics in this novel setup. If the backside is merely coated with metal layers, it could pose significant challenges for heat dissipation. We might need to adopt a different structure than what we currently use. Thirdly, and most significantly, the yield remains uncertain. Essentially, it's about thinning the wafer. When the process of thinning the wafer is not executed accurately, it becomes highly susceptible to breaking. Moreover, drilling TSV holes can cause the wafer to crack, making yield management for this new process quite difficult. That's why, as I mentioned earlier, a carrier wafer is utilized during the front-end process to handle the wafer with greater stability. By significantly reducing the thickness of the silicon from both sides, the wafer becomes extremely delicate and almost fluttery. Consequently, Intel, as previously highlighted by their former CEO Pat Gelsinger, has been vigorously advocating their power via technology for quite some time. They refer to the use of Nano TSVS. Do you notice it here? In the original structure, the power lines on the front side are thicker, as you can see. When these components are separated in this manner, the essential point is to use TSVS, which are very small holes at the nanoscale, to connect the front and back side of the chip. This connection is achieved by utilizing even smaller TSVS, essentially functioning as elevator holes between the transistors. Basically, separating the mixed structure is the fundamental approach of applying BSPDN, and they chose to efficiently supply current by directly attaching this metal contact to the transistor. This is called direct contact, and by doing this, you can shorten the power supply path and minimize IR drop. This is called a buried power rail, which is embedded in the backside of the wafer. The idea is to place it in such a way that the signal wires are as far apart as possible to minimize interference. However, TSMC takes a slightly different approach. TSMC's method is often called the Noble Backside Power Delivery Solution, or simply the Power Rail method. The essence of TSMC's approach is to stay as close to traditional techniques as possible. They also take a very cautious stance when it comes to GAI structures. Rather than simply moving the metal components from the front side to the back side, Intel employs nano through silicon vias to position the thin through silicon vias as close as possible to each other. However, the concept here is to just route the power rails and connect only the necessary parts exactly where needed. This approach is quite different from the traditional power contact method. In this way, the structure falls almost straight down from the top. You can think of it like this. Using the same layout footprint, flexibility can be achieved within the same device. This is what they are talking about. Therefore, Intel is aggressively shaving off a significant amount from the backside. This leads to substantial silicon wastage. Almost no silicon remains. What they do is strip the backside and carve it out, making various modifications and drilling holes. Meanwhile, TSMC is considering a more selective approach, focusing only on the necessary parts of the backside. This way, when transitioning to a new process, they aim to avoid significant risks associated with major changes. Naturally, latecomers tend to be more bold. Ultimately, this is the key point. How do we manage to separate the various power and signal lines that are so intricately intertwined and complex? The basic BSPDN structure involves placing what was done on the top side both above and below. To implement this better, Intel has thinned the backside and drilled TSVs. They approach it by attaching them. TSMC, on the other hand, places the power on the backside and connects it. While this might not seem like a huge difference, it's a difference in philosophy. The way each company implements BS-PDN will differ based on their processing equipment and the extent of etching involved. The nanoscale structure and heat management techniques will also vary when actually fabricated. We'll get a clearer picture once it's out. So as new technologies like 1.8 nanometers are introduced, I'll review the technical reports and compile the essential insights for you. This has been Engineering Error.